It's not easy, is it, my friend, to live in opposition to the world, to be going on a narrow path when they're taking a wide path and they are parting down that road all the time. It is not easy, is it, to always be gracious and kind and loving when the rest of the world is just letting you have it. It's not easy to be righteous, but oh, beloved, it is rewarding. We'll talk about it today. Are you at peace, precious one? That's my question because this week what we're looking at is we're looking at the peace that belongs to the righteous, the peace that comes from trusting, the trust that comes because you know that you have an everlasting rock in God that cannot be moved. The peace that comes because you're living according to the precepts of God. This is what we want to look at. And as we move into Isaiah chapter 26 and 27, we're finishing up now a segment in Isaiah that is absolutely astounding because God takes us in this passage in 26, 24, 25, 26, and 27. He takes us to the ultimate judgment of the earth. And yet, as he tells how he's going to devastate the earth, how he is going to lay it waste, as he describes what's going to happen to the inhabitants of the earth, there is a word there for the righteous. There is a promise there for the righteous. So what we're going to do is we're going to move through Isaiah chapter 26, segment by segment. And as we do, we're going to look at what God wants us to see about righteousness. And we're going to see about God being righteous and the way that he deals with sin. So in Isaiah 26, in verses 1 to 6, what he does is he lets the righteous know that we have a strong, everlasting city. Now, as you go through Isaiah 24, 25, and 26, and 27, one of the things you notice was God's comments about the city, about the unassailable city, the city that is full of pride, the city that says nothing can bring me down. I always think, and I'm not saying that New York City was this way, but I, I always think about New York City. And I mean, I love to go to New York City. I love to, to walk the streets of Manhattan, especially in, in the Christmas season. And I love the feel and the coldness of the air and, and everything. And yet what happened? New York City was brought down. New York City was brought down in an absolute instant, in an absolute instant, when on 9-11, those planes flew in to the Twin Towers. And what happened, we thought would never happen. People thought it was the end of the world. And what God wants you and me to understand is that all of the cities of this world are assailable. All of the cities of this world are able to be brought down except one. And that one city that will never be brought down is the city of Jerusalem. How I love to walk the streets of Jerusalem. How I love to go down in uh, downtown and, and, and sit there and watch the world go by. How I love to walk down through the little valley and, and, and go in through the Jaffa Gate and how I love to sit in the Jewish quarter and watch the children playing in the streets. 
It's been a city of great turmoil. One of the books that I would suggest that you read is called Old Jerusalem. It is a secular book, but it tells what Jerusalem, it's full of true stories, and what Jerusalem went through when there was the fight for Israel's independence. It's, it's absolutely incredible, and it is an eye-opener. But when I sit there, I know that trauma and judgment is coming to Jerusalem as well as to Israel. And yet I know the end of the story. I know that the end of the story is that we have a strong city. He sets up walls and ramparts from security for security. God does that. It says, open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. The one who remains faithful. One of the things that breaks my heart is to watch the disintegration and the degeneration of the United States of America. We once were a faithful nation. We once were a people who believed in God, who wrote and, and carved his name on the monuments in Washington, D.C., the center of our government, the epicenter of, of, of the way that this nation is run. There was a time when, when righteousness dwelt in those halls. And there was a time when there was a Supreme Court that feared God and that was there for the upholding of, of the commandments of God. But we have, we, have, we have become unfaithful. And he's saying, who's going to enter into Jerusalem? It's the city that is righteous. The righteous nation, I mean, it's the nation that is righteous. The righteous nation may enter. The one that remains faithful, the steadfast of mine, you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. Now put a time frame, put a green clock, uh, time sign, a green clock over forever. And note what he says, we are to trust in the Lord forever. We are never to stop trusting in God. It says, for in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. Now, in the light of that, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I want you to look at another song a song that Moses gave to the people to sing. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 31, verse 30, it says, Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were complete. There are songs in the word of God that we need to remember. There are songs in the word of God that we need to sing because they remind us of truth. And in the midst of turmoil, that song can come to our heart and keep us steadfast in mind and give us perfect peace. Well, he says in chapter 32, verse 1, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Now that sounds like familiar things. This is what God says in the opening of Isaiah chapter 1. When he calls the heavens and the earth to listen, it says, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets of the fresh grass, as the showers of, on the herb. For I proclaim the name of our Lord. Ascribe, ascribe greatness to our God. Now listen to what he says. The rock, his work is perfect. All the way throughout the scripture, God is known as a rock, a rock whose work is perfect for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And this is what God is telling us in Isaiah chapter 26. The righteous person, the righteous nation can enter into the city because he is trusting in the Lord because he knows that in the Lord he has an everlasting rock. Well, when I think of this, I think of Hebrews chapter 11 and I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 11 
verse 13. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have a, a listing. We call it the hall, not of fame, but the hall of faith. As God lists one after another of, of the people in the Old Testament who believed God, who stood fast, who knew that without faith it was impossible to please God. And it shows what God did as a result of their faith. Now, what's interesting to understand is that in the days that Hebrews was written, there was a great persecution going on. We'll see it in just a few minutes. But there was a great persecution of the Jews, the Jews who had believed that Jesus was Yeshua, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior. And they were getting persecution from their fellow countrymen, from, from uh, other Jews. They were getting persecution from Rome at that time because the Christians were being accused and, and because Caesar was declared as God. So here were these people caught in the middle. And as you look at it, what is God's word to them at that time? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, this is what it says. It says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. That's what we're doing today. We're seeing promises. We're seeing that we have an everlasting city. We're seeing that we have a strong city. And, and we see that that city is yet to come. But we, by faith, are embracing it in righteousness. It says, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. In other words, they knew they were marching to a different beat. They knew that they were not part of the current culture, not part of this godless age that has reared its puny fist in the face of God and walked in pride and rebellion. It says, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own a country of our own, a city of our own. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He has prepared a city for them. Well, what city is he talking about? He's talking about this strong city that the righteous can enter into. And when you look at it, he contrasts it with the cities of this world. And it's that contrast I want you to see. Because I want to see, I want you to see, which city are you looking for? Which city do you want to live in? We'll talk about it in just a minute. When God gets ready, beloved, to shake this earth and to shake the cities of this earth and to bring them low because of their unrighteousness, because of their ungodliness, because of their rebellion, Isaiah tells us that we who are righteous have a strong city. It's so interesting to go through and mark every reference to the city and what God says about the cities in Isaiah chapter 24, 25, 26, and 27. Because you see a contrast. You see a, a city uh, that, is, uh, that thinks it's unassailable. You see a city that says it is fortified and that nothing can bring it down. And yet that is a symbol of all the work of man. That is a symbol of the frailty of the work of man because God is going to level them all. But there is one that will stand. And he wants us to understand that. He wants us to know it 
as Christians. He wants us to understand that this belongs to the righteous. So watch what he does in Isaiah chapter 26 in verses 1 to 6. He's talking about trusting in the Lord, verse 4, forever. For in the Lord God, we have an everlasting rock. In other words, it will not be moved. It will not be shaken. It will not be altered. But then it says, for he, this rock that we have, has brought low those who dwell on high. It says, the unassailable city. He says, I have brought it low. Now, remember all the way through Isaiah, God keeps pointing to the pride of man. And he keeps telling how God has to abase the pride of man because it is fleshly pride, because it is, it is damnable pride, because it is destructive pride, because it is the pride of, of the king of Babylon that brought him low. It is the pride of Uzziah that brought him to death as a leper. God will not tolerate pride. Why? Because the root of pride is independence from God. You go back to Genesis. Just think with me. The serpent comes into the garden. The serpent says to Eve, yea, has God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For God knows, now watch the appeal to pride. God knows that the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will be as God. You will be as God. Then you can make your decisions. You don't need God telling you what to do. You don't need to depend on him. You can make your own decisions. You're going to know difference between good and evil. You can call the shots. Listen, that is pride and God brings pride low. So when it says the assailable city, the uh, fortified city set on high, I mark it the same way I mark pride with an arrow going up. And then I see the contrast. The arrow goes up, they're dwelling on high, the unassailable city, but God lays it low. What low? The unassailable city, the one that thinks that, that there's no way they're going to be brought down. He lays it low to the ground. He casts it into the dust. And the foot, the foot, now watch what it says, the foot will trample it. The feet of the afflicted, the steps of the helpless are going to walk on this city. This is how low it is going to come. So this is the first thing I want you to see about the righteous. Number one, that they have a strong city. Now we move into verse 7 of Isaiah 26, and we go from 7 through 10. And what do I want you to see here? Well, I want you to see that the way of the righteous is divinely, divinely smooth. It doesn't mean that there are not mountains and obstacles and difficulties. But because we are righteous, because we are doing what is right, because we are not walking in pride, but we are walking in obedience to God, independence to God, then the way of the righteous becomes smooth. Watch what he says. He says, the way of the righteous is smooth. O upright one, make the path of the righteous level. I, I am going to walk in righteousness. And, and, and because of that, it doesn't mean I'm not going to have difficulties, but it means I'm going to be able to go through those smoothly. It means I'm not going to become all shook up. It means that I'm not going to just absolutely lose it. It means that I'm going to keep my mind under control because the steadfast of mind he will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in him. It means I'm not going to fall apart. And that's what so many people are doing today. They are falling apart. And they're falling apart because they're not righteous and because they're not depending on the Lord and because the Lord is not smoothing out their way. It says, O upright one, make the path 
of the righteous level. Now, one of the things that you notice when you study Isaiah or the prophets and, and you read about the coming of the Lord, you see that he has prepared a highway, how he has, has removed the mountains and how there is a level place to walk. Why? Because that's the easiest place to walk. And so he goes on to say, indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you eagerly. God, I've been watching your judgment. I've been watching your judgment on Israel. I've been watching your judgment on Iraq. I've been watching your judgment on the nations. I've been watching your judgment on those that have mistreated Israel. Lord, I saw your judgment on Germany because of what Germany did to your people. I saw your judgment upon Britain because when Britain turned their back on Israel and when they gave over to the Palestinians, to those people, then what happened was Britain just came down and it's nothing, absolutely nothing to com compare to what that little country one day became. So he goes and he says this. He says, we have waited for you eagerly. He says, your name, even your memory is the desire of our souls. God, I want to hear about you. God, I want to talk about you. God, I want to think about you. This is the desire. This is the craving of my soul. God, I crave you. Precious one, what do you crave? What do you crave? Tell me what you crave and I'll tell you how your soul is. And then he goes on and he says this, your name, even your memory is the de uh, desire of our souls. At night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. What is he saying here? He's saying, look, he's saying the way that you get the attention of many people and turn them from being unrighteous to righteous is you bring your judgments upon this earth. When 9-11 happened, the churches were packed. Soon they were back to what they were, except for a few who learned from the judgment of God, who saw that God is sovereign and he is in control and that nothing happens, good or evil, without God's permission. Then they turn to God. And when you turn to God, you turn in righteousness. Oh, beloved, oh, beloved, live righteously. Beloved, do you know that I love you? Do you know that it is my greatest joy and delight to be able to talk to you, to open the word of God, to exercise the spiritual gift of teaching that God has given me? It is such a delight to me to know that you are studying the word of God. And this is what I want to focus our precept for life on today. We read... In Isaiah 26, that his soul was longing for God. Let me read it to you again so you get it. It says, while following the ways of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited eagerly for you. Your name, even your memory, the thought of you, thinking about you, is the desire of our souls. At night, my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. Don't you wish that were true of you? Don't you wish that you were just consumed with God? I do. I wish that at every waking moment or when I wake up in the middle of the night and I turn over and I, I, I look at the clock and I see how much time I have left to sleep, I wish my mind would go immediately to God, to a yearning to him, to a longing to him. I'll tell you what will do it. 
It will be what you focus on, what you spend time on. If there's anything that is dampening your thirst for God, your longing for God, your thoughts about God, if there's anything that is preoccupying your mind, you need to counteract it by spending time in the Word of God. And what I would suggest that you do is you go to the book of Psalms and that you read through the book of Psalms and you read them aloud and you bask in what you learn of God and how He calls you to worship Him. Because when you do this, when you do this, you'll find that in the night watches, you will begin to think about him. You have to train your mind. You have, to, you have to develop that appetite. And the way that you develop, have you ever had anybody say to you, taste it, it's good. No, I, I don't think I'd like it. Oh, try it. You'll like it. And then you try it and you like it. And then you want more. That's what happened to me with peanut butter and jelly. Try it the Psalms. Try God. You'll like it. Thank you for watching today. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life. If there's anything that is dampening your thirst for God, your longing for God, your thoughts about God, if there's anything that is preoccupying your mind, you need to counteract it by spending time in the Word of God. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.